thank you everybody for um, having me here today. Uh, I want to share with you uh, some of my thoughts on the emerging field of forensic facial imaging and some of the uh, emerging trends and where it was and where it's going and such. So let me go ahead and uh, share my screen and we'll go ahead and get to it since we've only got 30 minutes. So let me, um, there we go, kill my camera so I can focus on talking rather than looking in the camera here. Uh, let's see. All right, here we go. Modern techniques in forensic facial imaging and identification. This is one of those fields that unlike a lot of the scientific fields that you are all doing uh, tremendous and wonderful research in, it's very subjective in terms of how people interpret it and how it's applied uh, during criminal investigations. Uh, but you know, it's over a century old and it's still making progress in terms of the studies and some of the research that's going on around the world. So, uh, you know, that was such a humble uh, introduction that uh, Dr. Pandy gave me. And just to briefly touch on a couple of things, I've been a forensic artist now for 40 years. And I was actually, uh, rather than coming from an academic background, I actually come from a, a more of an applications type of, of background. So um, I was a, a, a sergeant when I retired, I had a lot of detective experience. And, you know, this whole art of um, forensics in terms of the art of crime solving, as I call it, uh, mostly uh, involves good communication skills, which my um, police career certainly prepared me for. I, I have over 1,300 hours of specialized police training and almost over 900 hours, actually almost 1,000 hours of specialized training in forensic facial imaging. And as you can see, I've been around since the beginning, helping the FBI put their uh, course together and also uh, working as a consultant and a trainer for uh, some of my competitors uh, before I started my own company and created um, my own facial composite software. I was kind of learning the ropes and seeing what was working and what wasn't working. So I've been fortunate enough to be in on the ground floor and work with some of the best people that have done this. And um, I'm really thankful to be able to reach out now and make uh, relationships, establish relationships and in, in working uh, with some esteemed people like yourselves around the world. So, you know, crime is universal. It's not something that's just, you know, uh, restricted to the United States or the Los Angeles area where I am at. It's worldwide. We may call it something different, uh, but, you know, it is what it is. It's crime and people are, are getting hurt and we have to, uh, you know, keep trying to find ways to uh, take technology and takes uh, the studies that's going on in the universities and such and being able to apply it in the field. So that was one of the reasons I started my own consulting company, Sketch Cop Solutions, so we could offer this type of investigative training and, and support um, to law enforcement and the academic community, because I think it's one of those things where we, um, you know, where we can learn from one another. So in other words, you know, if you were to ask me you know, what exactly do you do with Sketch Cop Solutions? What exactly do you do as a forensic facial imaging specialist? I would tell you that, you know, we provide products, services, and training to law enforcement and academic institutions around the world based upon researching best methods and implementing that research. And then it's sometimes collaborating with research scientists um, to, um, you know, to take their best practices and, and apply them in the field to see if, to see if they work. So um, although I don't have uh, a college degree per se, I, I have, uh, you know, completed college studies and I've completed specialized studies and I have really been out there on the street taking this stuff and, and really seeing if it works because sometimes, sometimes that you can't recreate in the laboratory what goes on in the field. So in other words, if you um, are trying to replicate the trauma that someone feels when they're the victim of a sexual assault or someone sticks a gun in their face and robs them or tries to stab them, you'll never be able to recreate that fear. So it's, um, it's taking what you think you know and people like me to, to, to tell you whether it's working or not. And so I think that's where the collaborative effort comes in between you know people who do the applications like myself and people like yourself who do the, uh, the studies. And you know, when, when it comes to some of this we'll talk about tonight, um, 
you know, it's very important, some of the work that's going on today. So let's go back to the very beginning. I apologize for speaking so fast, but I have a few slides and I've got 30 minutes and this is a vast, vast topic uh, that we're preparing training on uh, right now. So we can kind of take the time, you know, later to make sure that, um, you know, people understand it. So it really started over a hundred years ago. The first uh, recorded composite sketch was created in Britain. Oops in 1881 and they didn't have, um, although they had mugshot cameras uh, then, you know, photography and, and, and taking police photos wasn't as widely used as it is today. So uh, this involved a murder on a train and, and they actually had a witness who described uh, this person to an artist, not a police sketch artist because there were no police sketch artists back then. Um, just someone who could draw, someone who was competent at drawing and was able to come up with this sketch. And the sketch was instrumental in, in, in helping, um, you know, capture this person uh, who committed the murder. And then after that, um, you know, they kept using sketches in police investigations. Uh, again, you know, grabbing whoever they could. If, um, if they had a large uh, newspaper nearby, they would grab cartoonists and editorial comic strip anyone who could handle a pencil and draw. And it wasn't until, you know, and as you can see from this uh, slide, you know, we continued in the United States using it um, here involving uh, high profile criminal investigations like the uh, assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, some high profile serial killings, uh, some mysterious, uh, you know, plane hijackings and whatever, um, if you were to look at uh, a case file for a major case investigation here in the United States, you would probably find a police artist sketch in here somewhere. So from 1881, it wasn't until 1984, a hundred years later, just over a hundred years later, when myself and a group of people met at the FBI Academy to plan the curriculum for the first um, police, formal police sketch artist course at the FBI Academy, in Quantico, Virginia, the United States Congress uh, allotted money for it and they started training police sketch artists from around the world actually, and not only the United States, but uh, there were um, you know, artists that came from other countries as such. Unfortunately, they no longer hold the class because of budgetary restrictions and such, um, but uh, it was important enough you know, you know, for the government to pay attention to it as a viable art and finally, uh, I think it wasn't until the uh, late 80s, early 90s that the International Association for Identification actually recognized it as the ninth forensic discipline, uh, you know, along with, you know, blood stain, fingerprints, forensic photography, things like that. And they've been trying to make progress ever since in terms of elevating the training and elevating the quality of the uh, police sketches that are out there. Uh, but at the same time, there were people that realized that, you know, sometimes, it, you know, having a sketch artist wasn't enough because there wasn't enough sketch artists to go around. Uh, so they wanted to uh, create something that would make it so that anybody uh, on a police department that could interview somebody uh, could take and create a composite sketch. And so in the late fifties, early sixties, a, um, a laboratory technician for the Los Angeles police department created the Identikit. And it was, it was sold to and marketed by Smith & Wesson as a, as a, a private venture. And uh, they would lease these boxes. Of, it was a wooden box with um, cellophane overlays. And each cellophane overlay had a code uh, assigned to it and a facial feature that was printed on top of it. So you'd put you know, nine or 10 of these together to create a face. And then you could, you know, make a Xerox copy of it, you know, on a copy machine and, and put it on a wanted bolt. It was kind of crude back then, uh, but it did the job and it helped capture lots of criminals. Um, so although police departments preferred having a sketch artist on staff because the training was limited and the resources were limited, um, there were a lot more of these boxes of, uh, acetate facial features, the identikits going around and were widely used in police departments. Because at that point in time, there wasn't really any computer solutions. It wasn't until the late 80s, early 90s uh, that you started seeing a digital solution. And that digital solution, uh, 
you know, there were there were maybe about a half dozen, a little less than a half dozen that, that came out there. But the computer graphics and the capabilities, memory and such, uh, you know, speed and power of the computers wasn't what it is today. And, you know, computers back then used to be these big boxy things like, like you know, televisions and such. They were huge and they were heavy and they're unwieldy. And they just didn't have the... Um, they just didn't have what we've got today. So one of the first, um, you know, uh, computerized systems was a CD fit. And you can see here they use photographs, elements of photographs to make try to make it look like a real person. And that was the thought that you know we wanted to make it look like a real person. And um, oops, I did something here. Okay, here we go. Um, they want to make it look like a real person because everyone thought that the more photographically it looked like a real person, the better it would be. Um, but that wasn't necessarily true. Uh, police artist uh, for San Jose Police Department, Tom Macris, he created, at the time, he was one of the best sketchers, I mean, in the world. He was a great artist. His hand-drawn sketches uh, caught a lot of criminals. And he worked with a computer company to uh, digitize some of his drawings and such and create um, a program called CompuSketch. And that was one of the first forerunners of a really credible uh, computer system software that actually produced images that looked like a police artist sketched it. Because really when you, sh when you show somebody a composite sketch that looks like a mugshot of somebody, people's minds, they take it very literal. They think that that is the person that they're supposed to be looking for versus an artist sketch, everyone recognizes a sketch is nothing more than an approximation of someone's memory. So their mind kind of fills the gaps in and, and kind of makes that leap in terms of, you know, it could look like the person, it may not look like, it may be this person, may not be that person, versus that photographic composite that leads you to believe that it has to be that person. So, um, but, you know, again, very simple. If you look at the image tips, if you look at the image types, very crude, very elementary looking. Um, you know, these were better quality than the, oops, than, oh my goodness, go back here, um, than this. But, you know, both of them did their job. I mean, at the end of the day, as long, if you catch somebody as a result of the sketch, then it, then it, then it does a, you know, then it lends credibility. It makes it a viable tool. People recognize it as being a viable tool. So look at the copy sketch here. You can see the, the dot stippling of the, um, I don't want to do that, of the uh, image in terms of shading, it looks very crude, looks very elementary, but yet it looks very similar to this suspect. This is courtesy of the Idaho State Police who back uh, 1988, it looks like when they arrested him, late 80s, um, you know, I, I, I think somebody could look at this sketch and look at him and say, yeah, it's probably the same person. So. Um, you know, it, it did its job. So, you know, as we progress, you know, again, some people like their pencils, some people like their chalks, artists are artists. And when you really look about, when you really look at this, it is the perfect blend of science and art, the science being the psychology behind it. And really seriously, it's important to be able to draw as well as you can to be successful, have some sort of art background, because as we're moving into the digital realm, you know, you can hang on to your pencils and papers, but I'm going to talk about why it's a good idea to progress and move to digital. So you can see the hand holding the stylus here. This is my preferred tool today. I've been, uh, I've been digital since 2015, so I haven't touched a pencil to do a, a police sketch in over five years now. So a digital do tools and drawing software, what they give you an opportunity to do is what basically what it is, is the digital tool is a pen tablet or a graphic display device like this here, pictured here, where you can actually use the stylus to draw on the screen like you're drawing with a pencil on a piece of paper or chalk or whatever medium you want, because the software, um, like the software illustrated here, Corel Painter, actually has chalks. Uh, watercolors, oil painting. I mean, you can do whatever you do with your hand media, you can do in the digital tools and also a, a drawing software. I actually use the pencil function for mine and it works perfectly. It looks like an, an artist is, is, is drawing it. 
There's no difference. And now when you look at um, what's happening with the coronavirus, uh, you know, it, it's perfect because we can do no contact eyewitness interviews with uh, victims of crime uh, from either down the street or several thousand miles away. Uh, I routinely work, uh, I do sketches for the Los Angeles Police Department and most of my victims when I talk to them are 70 to 100 miles away. And a lot of the victims I talk to with my, in my role as a Baltimore Police Department sketch artist, over 3000 miles away. So you take a country like India, how large and populous India is and some of the transportation challenges you have and, you know, and pick any country really, especially these days where they're limiting contact with people and they're limiting people traveling. Uh, you know, a lot of police think that they can't do sketches anymore because you have to be in the room with the person with your pencil and paper drawing when in reality you don't. I have a, a, a graphic display device, much like that was illustrated, and I'm drawing right on my screen. They're seeing my screen. I'm connecting my screen to them. And most of the time, they're on their cell phone, as you can see here. This is what they're seeing right here, is this sketch. They're watching me draw it on their cell phones. So cell phone and web meeting uh, software and the various platforms on which they work actually extend the reach of the artist and extend the capabilities of the police department. So, you know, you couldn't do that if you had a, um, a pencil or paper. I mean, you probably could uh, put a, a digital camera on a tripod and, and put it over your shoulder while the victim watches you draw. Uh, but it seems pretty unwieldy and it seems pretty clumsy in terms of a, a method for doing that. Uh, you know, we're always looking for ways and I always believe, um, I believe that, um, the best product for a facial composite software product is an actual sketch. So when the um, officer or the operator is using the software to put the sketch together, the end result should look like a police sketch or look like somebody drew it by hand versus a photograph. And so as you can see in this image here uh, of our software, um, you can, uh, you know, we can create libraries of various ethnicities and nationalities. Uh, we can, uh, you know, we can input whatever hats we want. Uh, and that's the nice thing about digital. It, it not only makes, it only, I believe it makes me a better artist because it gives me a wider array of tools to work with, but it also allows me to create facial libraries similar to police sketch software programs like SketchCop, where you, um, if you draw, uh, like in Baltimore, I drew every, it seemed like every criminal there wore a, a hoodie. And so I was drawing hoodies every day. So finally I just, you know, scanned a hoodie a couple of different varieties of hoodies. And so now whenever somebody says that, you know, the person is wearing a, a hoodie or a certain type of baseball cap, I can just go in my library, bring it into the sketch and touch it up. And I save lots of time drawing. It also creates a more efficient workflow because you can create interview forms where the eyewitness fills it out. You can draw it, you can share um, the image on the screen with them, and then they can make adjustments to the image. And then you can send that image via email to the detective who can copy and paste it into a wanted bulletin and or post it on a website in much less time than they could have in the old days of taking a drawing, having to make a Xerox copy on a copy machine or having to take a photograph of it and have the, have the crime lab develop the photo. It just, it really makes the workflow in a lot smoother. What programs like SketchCop does is it allows people who are non-artists but who want to contribute to their police department or their community, it allows them to learn how to interview, how to talk to people, how to get that information from them and how to manipulate the software to create the, the image of a, of a crook for police. In countries like India and other countries that, that use sketches quite a bit, software programs and digital tools allows them to um, make that leap and extend their ability to you know, create the faces of crime, so to speak. Now, some of the other areas uh, that you know forensic artists work in and where technology takes hold, and I think Dr. Pandy can appreciate this because she does lots of work with clay reconstruction, is uh, tra traditional clay reconstruction. Now, in this image you'll see here, it's a split screen where half of it's the skull and you can see the tissue depth markers here. This is where a lot of the research comes in with, in the forensic art field in the forensic facial imaging field is the uh, tissue, the, the live studies they do and cadaver studies and the, the, the sonograms and, and some of the CT scans and such where they are able to um, update the tissue depth 
uh, tables and such information. You know, uh, you know, there's a lot of, I just read a paper the other day that um, I think they put out in, in Korea where they actually did a, a, a new way to triangulate and, and look at how uh, to determine the, 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 uh, the proper shape of the tip of the nose. You know, forensic odontologists are, you know, helping come up with, you know, proper lip measurements and mouth shapes and stuff. The problem with the clay uh, reconstruction is uh, you have to, it takes a lot of practice and quite the skill set to become a, a reasonably good sculptor to where, you know, you can come out with an image that's, that's meaningful, that's going to be helpful to an investigation. Also, too, is once you put that clay on, you'll cover up those teeth because most of the time your, the mouth is going to be closed. You're going to, um, you're going to close the uh, nasal aperture there. You're not going to be able to see a lot of those things you need to see to be able to manipulate the features and properly use the science to craft the features and such. So this is where we talk about traditional clay versus digital facial reconstruction. And, and trust me, I started out sculpting in clay, uh, much like this figure you see here. I had the armature with all the netting there for the neck and I had the, the prosthetic eyeballs and such. And, and so you can see on the right here, or yeah, on your right, this uh, skull, this transparency through this digital reconstruction I did. And I can, now I can see the, um, the skull. So I'm using like ZBrush, uh, Freeform, uh, Plus, uh, Cinema 4D. A lot of these programs, these clay sculpting programs have a transparency button on them, especially like this one I did in ZBrush where I can always check my work and I can always check the accuracy of the measurements and how I'm fitting the face to the tissue depth markers the set of the eyeball in the orbit. Um, I didn't have it on here, but this, uh, it looks like the framing of a house or a superstructure on a building uh, with all the um, rods and such I've got running through here to, to measure out the, the length and the projection of the nose and such. But, you know, having this, uh, the digital sculpting tools, uh, you can draw like you're with a stylus, like you're sketching, but you're actually sculpting. And you can always, uh, turn on and off the transparency button. You can rotate it every which angle, zoom in easily. And you can even do, um, you can even poly paint. This is the, uh, this is the finished version of uh, what I'd done uh, in the previous. And you can see here, uh, you know, a three quarter view and you, I can turn it every which way I want and take pictures in the software or I can export it uh, and it can be 3D printed uh, if, if a law enforcement agency wants to hold a press conference and invite the press and such. So uh, there's a lot of options you have. Again, you can, you can sculpt different hairstyles and, and beards and toggle them on and off. And again, technology. It used to be that uh, if there was a facial reconstruction to be done, a, law, a medical examiner or a coroner's office would actually send me the physical skull. And they weren't always the most pleasant things to work with, but you know, it is what it is. It's, but now I just have the agencies, uh, you know, g uh, provide me a CT scan. They just take, uh, if the medical examiner's office is big enough to, to afford to have their own CT scanner, if not, they take it to a local hospital and they have a CT scan and they uh, upload the DICOM file to my uh, file share service. I make a 3D model from that, a 3D skull model and import it into the clay digital reconstruction software and away I go and I can paint it in the end like this and, uh, and then send it back to them as a, as a two dimensional image. Photoshop is a great scientific tool. They actually have a scientific part of it where you can do measurements. They've got a 3D option. It's more than just a tool for working uh, for photographers, you know, to touch up their uh, pictures and their photographs and such uh, and to composite them, do all, all the things that they do for, you know, advertising the things they use pictures for. I use Adobe Photoshop to do one-to-one -one photo comparisons and analysis work. And again, you know, we're, we're dealing with a lot of morphological examination of different facial features and such and doing the one-to-one -one comparisons. And we use the, uh, I use the guides to make sure that the uh, proportions are, are, are similar. Um, I use the zoom tools and the marking tools and such to be able to create, create my exhibits and such. And um, it, it works really, really well for, for doing that. And again, this is where the scientific and the research part of, of this 
involves, you know, study of anatomy, you know, keeping up on, on, on different, you know, illnesses and different conditions that may affect uh, the look of people's faces and such, you know, how it translates uh, to the skull and, and, and such. And this is where, you know, a lot of forensic facial imaging work is actually a collaborative team effort. It's very, it's a, if you're smart, you'll take a multidisciplinary approach. I, I never try to do this by myself. Um, if I have a question, I always, in, you know, invite the forensic anthropologist, the forensic odontologist to give their input because I'm just, you know, one person and um, these tools, these digital tools really help, uh, you know, to be able to share images back and forth as well as for me as the person who's, um, it's almost like, you know, someone writing music and you playing improperly, being able to properly play it. and. Um, you know, I, I just, I, I can't, you know, I, I, it's hard to go back to the analog way of doing things, you know, now that I've been doing it uh, digitally for over five years now. And again, Photoshop is a great tool for uh, two-dimensional reconstruction. Sometimes, uh, you know, some people don't like the sculpt and some people just prefer uh, to use uh, Photoshop. And so what we do is, uh, you know, we put the tissue depth markers on the skull, as you can see here. And um, look for my stylus here. And so you can see right here, you know, the tissue depth markers on the skull. And you take a one-to-one -one photograph, uh, full frontal, so it's level, and put in the Frankfurt horizontal. And then you, um, of course, you put a, a scale tool in there so you can make it one-to-one, uh, -one so everything measures well. And then what I do is um, I take. Uh, I took a piece of paper and, and laid it over the skull and, and, and sketched around here and created a light pencil sketch. And then I took photographs and I composited them together and made based upon the skull. And then I overlaid the, um, I laid the, 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 uh, the photographs on, created the photographic face. And then I laid the sketch over the top of it to make it look like a, uh, a, a high quality lifelike type of sketch. So again, it's got that photographic feel to it, but it's more like a sketch. So people look at this facial reconstruction like a composite and say, yeah, that, that could be him. That could be the person instead of seeing a, a photo composite and saying, oh, that's gotta be exactly the same person because people are so literal. Age progression and missing children, missing adults, fugitives from justice. Uh, Photoshop is a great tool to use. Again, you know, uh, science, aging principles, research studies by dermatologists and, and, and uh, you know, uh, plastic surgeons who rebuild people's noses and, and, do, and, and you know, give, do work on people's faces and such. A lot of that research is, is very important as well. And again, digital tools make it a lot easier because what happens is sometimes people, regardless how good an artist they are, is they will try to redraw the face. And there's something that gets lost in, in transit between the hand and the brain and the eye and such. And then a lot of times the artist puts their own artistic spin and interpretation on it. I prefer to work straight from the photo because you don't lose any image integrity that way. You, you keep that resemblance that's much stronger if you do that. It, it just looks like an older version of, of what it's supposed to be, which is that person, without any stylized artwork going into it. And again, I use uh, you know, Photoshop and Painter and as well as you know, listening to the experts and, and keeping, in, uh, keeping in mind um, environmental damage, lifestyle damage, you know, what, what, what happens to a person who's a heavy smoker? What happens to a person in skin that spends too much time out in the sun? The science tells us that, the researchers tell us that. So again, whatever you're researching, I'm the guy that's putting it into practice and working with you in that multidisciplinary approach to make sure we get the best image possible, the most accurate image possible to put out the law enforcement. And then of course, uh, lastly, there's been a lot of talk about uh, DNA uh, you being used to recreate the face. And there's a company here in the United States that does that. And um, it costs a lot of money. A lot of agencies pay it for cold cases to create uh, facial composites. They don't know how accurate they are. 
I, I think I read an article the other day that some researchers came up with the number that was 203 genes that affect the, the, the person's facial appearance. And, uh, you know, the company here that does these said they can come up accurately with the sex, approximate age, body mass, ancestry, skin tone, freckles. But that's it. So I'm not sure how they get the eye, the shape of the nose, the shape of the lips. Um, it's proprietary information. So obviously they're not going to share. Um, but, you know, this is something that they're working on now is to try to create faces from, you know, accurate faces from nothing more than DNA. Or uh, I think some companies are working on some mind mapping stuff where they can hook your head up with some electrodes or something and you can think about the suspect and it'll, your thoughts will go out onto a computer and create that face and such. So not quite sure how that's going to work, but um, the, my last slide here is, uh, this is an example. Uh, this is um, our software. Uh, an eyewitness described this person. And then for whatever reason, the, comp uh, the police department contracted to have a DNA composite done. And this was a suspect that they arrested. Uh, he'd grown a beard. It was a, a, quite a, a length of time. Um, I don't know, you, know, you can argue which one looks closer. Uh, the, the person who described the police sketch artist, there were some blemishes on the face that the DNA didn't catch. But yeah, if you look here, there's some there's some blemishes right here on his cheeks and such. And I think the, the flat lip here, similar to here and the, the way the mouth bows in, in the middle and such. I don't know why they felt the need to get a DNA composite, but you know, they did. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it's something to, you know, get people talking about your cases again, and, you know, especially their cold cases and such. Um, I think it's got promise. I don't know that it's where it should be yet, but it's working for some agencies. So, you know, who am I to say? So I think my half hour is just about up. Uh, I appreciate you guys uh, being patient listeners.